See Beneath Your Beautiful podcast is raw and intimate, sometimes funny, and always entertaining. With new episodes every Saturday, Hara explores our loves, fears, and hopes with a delicious combination of depth and lightness. Today, we interview Andrea. Andrea, will you introduce yourself? Sure. I'm very, very excited to be here. So I am a little bit of everything. Uh, In my day job, I am a digital media and social media consultant. In my passion, I am a constant question asker, and I focus on questions more than I think any sane human being probably should. But it's what I absolutely love doing is encouraging people to ask more questions in their life. And personally, I'm a little bit weird and odd and different and joyfully so, I like to think. Well, you did a TED talk on questions. I did. I did a TEDx talk about uh, four years ago now, four or five years ago, on the importance of asking questions and what gets in our way and why we should do it more often. And I went to a dinner you hosted where we were asked questions. To give a little bit of context, I've been asking questions online every single weekday since January of 2013. And I've got a database of almost 2,500 questions now and and still counting. So I love seeing how people interact with questions and kind of what it sparks in them and with them. The dinner you came to was one of my favorites. I'm hoping to be able to do more of those in the future. It's one of those things that once, you know, things are a little bit more back to in-person stuff, I think is on my list of things I want to focus on doing more of. I like to refer to it as my drug of choice is public speaking. And if I could make my living off doing public speaking, and then these dinners become a side project for that same thing that I'm speaking about, which is ask more questions. So many people will say in keynote speeches or in podcasts or in their self-help books or whatever, they always just say, oh, the key to fixing this is just ask more questions or ask yourself more questions or but they never talk about what gets in the way or how to develop that questioning skill or how to even think differently about the world enough to ask a question. You mentioned you had a podcast that you were not doing at the moment. Are there questions there that they could then refer to like to use as a database? Yeah, they can either go to the backlog of the podcast, which is just questions.show, or you can go to a side project I've been working on It's still not programmed perfectly well, which is why I haven't announced it widely to the world, but it's just questionsbot.andreaparish.com and it will randomly show you questions from my full database. Oh, cool. So there's thousands of questions there for them to choose from. Were you always curious as a kid? According to my father, I have been asking questions since two minutes after conception. I was always the kid who was saying like, well, why is it this way? And what is it that caused this? And I skipped a grade in school. And some say it was because the work they had me doing was not challenging or anything like that. But I honestly wonder if they had me skip a grade, if for no other reason than I kept annoying the teachers by asking too many questions. (laughs) They'd say, Andrea, just stay quiet, read ahead. And so I would read ahead. And then I would be through an entire year's worth of schoolwork in like three months. (laughs) Are you working just as a consultant now? Yeah, for the last year, I've been working primarily as a consultant and freelancer. I do a little bit of everything when it comes to the consulting. I've helped a couple of organizations with writing questions, both for apps and for their own programs and that kind of stuff. I also do social and digital media consulting because that's the vast majority of my professional experience. And I have a couple of organizations there I've helped with their social media, digital media, branding, a lot of that kind of work. But really, I'm focusing on now that it's starting to become a little bit more safe in some areas, I'm working towards doing more public speaking and public presentations and doing all of that kind of stuff. I think I met you at a tweet up. I remember the days of those tweet ups. I miss them. But yeah, I think it was what, almost a decade ago? I don't know why I went to a tweet up. That just fascinates me that I ever did that. But I'm I'm glad I met you there. So excited to have met you there too. Honestly, our interactions always, I enjoy them so much because you are open and honest and willing to ask questions, but also because you are so much yourself and you are honest about it. And that's one of the things I truly value in people. And so it's just, I love every time we talk. That is exactly what I like about you. I don't know if you know this, but, and this is my perception. Tell me if I'm correct. I have had a real struggle with my weight and my size. 
I didn't understand until recently how you could truly love yourself being overweight. I'm not sure if that's true for you that you do. I, that's my perception that you do, that you are comfortable in your body and maybe don't even consider yourself overweight. I'm not trying to be offensive. I'm just saying that I finally understand how to love me and not necessarily what I look like. And I've always appreciated that about you, but I'm not sure I understood it until very recently. Is that true for you? What do you think about all that? First of all, it makes me happy down to the core of my being that you are walking in that path of self-acceptance and body love and if nothing else, body neutrality, that you are more than what you look like. One of my favorite quotes is really, you are a ghost walking a meat mech around a multiplayer universe and you're worried about what your mech looks like. You get to be an embodied ghost for a while. Why not enjoy that experience? But I find it so interesting and to some extent validating and to some extent worrying that I'm seen as saying F you to society standards, especially when it comes to body size, because I am six foot four as an adult. And currently I'm probably around 350 to 375. I don't know. And I have truly struggled with my weight my entire life. It was one of my most formative memories about my siblings is them making fun of me by saying that I needed to go see Jenny Craig when I was eight years old. Mm. It was the number one thing I was made fun of for in school. And it is a constant and utter frustrating struggle of fat phobia and fat discrimination. And I had an eating disorder for years. I have struggled with the medical infrastructure for years. I've struggled with employers and their wellness programs that focus on BMI. Part of the reason I am so strongly focused on presenting myself as if I have no shame for who I am is partially that I have way too much fucking shame for who I am mm -hmm. because I was told that like it's not a parental thing they are wonderful human beings and I'm the second shortest of my family <laughs> It's not like I'm this massive giant in a family of tiny people. Like my dad is six, eight and is built like a brick house. And like when I was 15 and I needed a suit for speech and debate, it wasn't go down to Walmart because that was the only store we had in town in a tiny town of 10,000 people and buy the cheap $20 suit that everyone else was. It was my mom and I having to drive 180 miles to Salt Lake City and go to the plus size women's store and having a doctor when I was 12 and experiencing the first set of cramps I'd had, PMS cramps that were so bad, I was screaming and writhing in pain and having the ER doctor tell me and tell my parents, oh, it's probably just a little bit of gas, maybe some cramps. If she loses weight, they'll go away. This is a very interesting day to be having this conversation because this week I need to fire my therapist or end our, our therapeutic relationship because in our last session, she told me that because I obviously am doing healthy things and I'm obviously eating fine, that really my weight is just an indication that I'm holding on to too much. And if I pay more attention to my mental health, then the weight will just come off. Mm. When what I was trying to talk to her about is that it frustrates me that the world is so focused on weight that I couldn't find a good biking, a set of good purpose-made biking clothes for a century ride I want to do later this year. That's too bad. The thing is, it doesn't surprise me. It doesn't shock me. It barely is even tipping my this shouldn't happen meter. Mm -hmm. If I let all of that get to me to the point that I do not continually propose to the world with my attitude that I don't care. It shows people that weight and size and everything else that is weird about me is something to be ashamed about. I started asking questions. I started saying, okay, what is the research behind this drug that I'm on that makes it so I can't eat? What does it actually mean that I am the size I am and I have always been big mm -hmm. and I have yet to find not even a majority, a plurality of scientifically backed, double blind, peer reviewed studies 
that say that weight loss and weight loss programs and weight loss efforts are successful in anything other than causing shame. When I'm biking 100 miles a week, I still wear a size 26. Right. Well, this is so interesting. It makes me a little sad because I had this vision of you not feeling any shame. And so I wish the world would stop shaming weight, but I think I've been guilty of it myself, even as a fat person. Like, as a matter of fact, I remember being in a meeting once and I was overweight, of course. I owned my own business at the time. And I remember a client came in and I remember thinking, why are they listening to me? I'm a fat person. I discounted my own self. I wrote a poem a couple of years ago, and it was actually about being queer, but it fits a lot of other things, too. I am told that pride is a sin, that it come before a fall, yet shame is the twin, deadly and dangerous, yet pride, the life-saving antidote for that shame which threatens to kill. For it is only with pride that we can survive the sin that we are told is being ourselves. Mm -hmm. It's so easy to question yourself because you're told you should question yourself. You can say, I know I shouldn't do this, or I know I should do this and should yourself to death. Or you can say, you know what, this is who I am and let it be. I can't believe I've felt this way for so long. And I finally feel different now that I photograph so many women because all I see is their beauty. I'm just finally looking at myself through my own lens with love. What a lovely place to be finally. I am a six foot four, fucking loud, outspoken, fat, polyamorous, queer girl from a small town. Everybody feels the shame of the diet industrial complex and patriarchal world and fat phobia. And there are so many things in the world that if somebody didn't feel shame, then I would wor- didn't feel like there was something wrong. I'd worry that they weren't paying attention. It's just a question of how you react to those feelings. I have photographed skinny women who are not happy with the way they look. People are just so conditioned to not love themselves. You mentioned a lot of things in that last sentence that you were polyamorous, queer, I think you said. So discuss some of those things. How long have you known you were queer? Queer is okay? Or is it like you can say it and I can't? Queer is how I self-define. And queer is also what is often used when you either know somebody is on the gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, or poly, like on the spectrum of there is something weird here, (laughs) essentially, or something different Different, here. Queer just kind of encompasses all because I have in the past defined myself as bisexual. And then I went to pansexual. What's the difference? Bisexual generally means attracted to both genders, attracted to both men and women. Pansexual generally means attracted to people of all genders. So it's more inclusive. I have a partner who is biologically and physically male, but self-identifies as gender neutral. Hmm. So technically doesn't fit into a gender binary there. So, but queer just kind of encompasses all alternative is what it would have been called back in the nineties. I'm willing to talk about this stuff because I know a lot of other people aren't. So ask away, like all of the ridiculous questions you think, should I ask them? I am the person to ask them. Okay. And I'm not afraid to ask a question because my sixth grade teacher said, there's no stupid question. You're only stupid if you don't ask it because you don't know. I like your sixth grade teacher. Did you say your husband uh, identifies as gender neutral? So one of my partners does, which gets into the polyamorous thing. So queer is my sexuality. I am attracted to, in a romantic as well as a sexual sense, people of all gender expression. And that is... Technically, both my sexual orientation and my relationship orientation in that I do enjoy having romantic relationships in my relationship style category. um, I'm polyamorous, which means that I have multiple committed loving relationships in a romantic sense with other individuals in a open, known, communicative way. Um, It's also referred to as ethical non-monogamy, which is... I'm not monogamous, but I attempt my damnedest to be ethical about it, as opposed to people who are not monogamous and not ethical about it. So I have my husband that I have been married to, man, for 11 years now here in a few months. So we've been married for over a decade. And then I have a partner. Uh, they, They, as in they singular, they're gender neutral. 
we've been together for almost eight years now, eight and a half years. And then I also, my best friend and I, we refer to ourselves as platonic wives a lot of times because had life circumstances been half a degree off of where they were, then she and I would have probably ended up together instead. And we are extraordinarily close. And then She is sexually monogamously married to her husband and all five of us live within a mile of each other and operate as a family unit. You mentioned once that your husband and your partner are very good friends. They are very close, partially because not shockingly, they share some interests beyond me, but they're both kind of geeky. They hang out a lot together and they play video games together and we help each other with our gardens. And so, yeah, they're, they're friends and hang out just as often as the rest of us. Does your p- husband have another partner? He has in the past. He doesn't right now. Some relationships last a very long time and some don't. Yeah. And um, over the 13, 14 years we've been together, he's had probably three or four other partners and just none of them are currently in the picture. I'm a jealous little Scorpio girl. Is there any jealousy? between all of you guys? Jealousy is a human emotion. Mm-hmm. I'm also half Scorpio. I'm a cusp baby. So even, even when it comes to astrology, I can't decide. I, <laughs> I just do a little of everything. Um, so jealousy is a human emotion. So yes, of course it happens. I think the big difference in long-term ethically non-monogamous situations is how you react to and handle jealousy. Mm. Because it becomes a point of discussion, it becomes an indicator that you have some kind of need that's not being met. Um, And it's a matter of having very extensive, sometimes processing discussions (laughs) about why am I feeling this jealousy? What's not being met? Is this something for me to process and deal with? Is this a boundary that needs to be set? Is this a need that needs to be expressed? So it becomes a chance for asking more questions and exploring a little bit more deeply. And sometimes it's a matter of just working through it. Like the first couple nights I spent the night at my partner's house, my husband was really jealous and we talked about it and I changed a couple of things to help accommodate where he was emotionally. And he changed a couple of things to accommodate where I was. and. Now, several years in, I get a, aren't you going to go stay at their house? I really want a video gaming night. (laughs) Yeah, jealousy happens. And it's just a matter of making the choice to do something different with it. And that doesn't make it inherently better or worse than any other way of dealing with it. It's just how we choose to. Yeah. Some people are naturally monogamous. My platonic wife is monogamous beyond belief. And her husband is like the most monogamous human being I have ever met in my life. And that's okay. Well, and that's the whole point. You're writing your own script and thank goodness you're not living by anybody else's standards or rules because it's your life and it's so short. That's what I mean by, you know, fuck it to societal standards. That's really what I mean is that you're, you're living your life the way you see fit. And I'm so proud of you for that because so many people don't. I do look up to you. Have you ever heard of Martin Buber's I and thou relationship? Mm -mm. He talks about how you can treat somebody else as a part of yourself, as a it, and project your thoughts and feelings and wants and needs and desires onto this person and interact with them as if they were an extension of yourself. Or you can interact with them as a thou, as a whole and complete individual that you're coming together to a conversation to create a whole new relationship out of your interaction. And he argues that an I-thou relationship is inherently healthier than an I-it relationship because it doesn't allow the other person to be themselves. And so I think that's a big part of it is so many people interact with others projecting onto them what they think rather than asking them what they think. Right. That's definitely true. Do you think everybody's getting what they need out of your, I was going to say triangle, but it's a five up out of our pod. We call it our pod. I mean, my understanding and my belief is that if anyone in our group is not getting what they need, then they bring it out in the open and we talk about it. You guys are so mature and 
there's an intelligence that's going along with this. It's not like sexually driven. It's more emotionally driven. Is that right? For our particular situation, yes. I mean, there are people for whom they are ethically non-monogamous purely for the sex. Um, More often than not, they identify themselves as swingers rather than polyamorous, Mm -hmm. Um, in which case, like, cool, more power to them if it works for them. What does it mean that your partner is non-binary? I don't know what that means. So that means that they don't identify fully as male or female. They have the physical parts of a male, but they identify just as strongly with female energy. They enjoy dressing in dresses and skirts as often as they do work pants and flannels. Um, They communicate in a more feminine way. They do not consider themselves transgender because they don't feel like they're fully female. So it's not a matter of my body and myself don't match. I'm not transgender, so I'm not going to speak to that specific experience. But generally, transgender means I am the other gender than I was born with. Whereas as a non-binary individual, they just don't identify fully as male or female. Mm -hmm. And so they kind of exist in this nebulous middle ground that's existed as long as humans have existed. We've just called it lots of different things. Was there anything else that I would find fascinating about you? I enjoy public speaking. I mean, I've been told that's weird. My worst nightmare. My sister was saying, you're just so out there. I said, everything I do is one-on-one. It just goes out there, but I'm only looking one person in the eye. I could never publicly speak. No, that's my drug of choice. Like, seriously, give me a little more of of that. Like, is it a stage with a group of 5,000 people? I am in for that. It's my adrenaline rush. It's what I enjoy doing. It's where I feel slow. It's just where I am happy. The energy of a room of people who are on the same page with you and vibing with you, it's my drug. So have you ever done theater? Theater? I can't say that word. Theater. Theater. When I was a kid, I was a part of the Blackfoot Community Players. and. I desperately want it on stage. I cannot sing if my life depended on it anywhere close to on key or in tune. Not a skill I possess. And community theaters do a lot of musicals. So I was probably six when I started trying out for shows. And finally, when I was 10, somebody took pity on me and put me in the tech booth. And then by the time I was 12 until the time I was 17, I ran Lights and Sound for almost every production that the Blackfoot Community Players did, including writing grants when I was like 16, trying to get new equipment in for the theater. And I loved that. And I ended up on stage a couple of times, um, once as the giant spider. I mean, more often than not, I was backstage, but I love it the same way because it's being a part of the magic of shared energy to create a story. I love live theater more than anything. Do you have a message besides fuck you all? What's the kindest thing people could know? What should they know? Like even myself telling myself, you know, why are they listening to me? I'm a fat person. What should I know? That somebody's body in full, in total, somebody's physical body is nobody's business but their own. And it has no moral value. If somebody has a particular ability or disability, that doesn't mean they have less value as a human being. If somebody is fat or if somebody is skinny, that means nothing about their value. If somebody is tall or short or has half purple and half green hair or has no hair. Somebody's physical body is not a moral judgment. You really made me cry just there. That was the perfect answer. That's it exactly. Thank you. Okay, you're getting me to tear up now. <laughs> like, it's the number of times every human being I have ever talked to about this has experienced somebody saying, you deserve those good things because you worked hard or telling themselves you don't deserve this good thing or you don't deserve to be listened to all of these deserve and earn and who in the hell said that we have to work to earn or have to deserve to exist 
Right. The way I found to love myself was to remember that I was born and I was somebody's precious miracle and nothing has changed. That's how I realized that I am still worthy of all that love and attention and kindness. I am still this a miracle and I have to treat myself as such. My mom, for some reason, was going to have six children and she had a miscarriage right before me and I'm the sixth kid. I'm so lucky to be here and to spend a moment of any day bashing myself when I'm a miracle is crazy. There's peace when you can just appreciate that you get to exist. No point wasting any time believing anybody's lies about you. Yeah, I love that about you. This was such a good conversation. I appreciate your openness and your just willingness to to be you. Do you have a favorite book that you would gift people? Yes. Uh, So I have three books I'm going to suggest because we've talked about three different areas and three different things. So book number one is Sex at Dawn. It is a book about how human beings approach relationships and sex and how science has talked about it in the past. It goes a little bit to the extreme, but it's a good starter book for thinking about relationships different. I would highly recommend Aubrey Gordon's What We Don't Talk About When We Talk About Fat, which she wrote under the pen name Your Fat Friend for quite a while and has only recently outed herself by name. Um, And her book is fascinating and heart-wrenching and encouraging and just it's an incredible book. And then I would also recommend the book called Art Curious. It's also a podcast. It's by a woman named Jennifer Dassel. And I recommend it because she asks questions about art that make it an, an exploration and a deep dive into beauty in a way that so few people explore it and got me asking questions about a lot of things that I wouldn't have otherwise. So I would highly recommend checking that one out too. Awesome. I'm excited to check all them out. I can't wait to read them. Well, thank you so much for spending this time with me. I really, really appreciate it. And I just, I just got so much out of it. I thank you so much. Thank you.